It is Pyarm King, and I'm really, really excited to bring you this particular guide to Curse of Strahd, the Fey Quest. I personally believe this is the magnum opus, the pinnacle of quest lines for Curse of Strahd. This is the Brothers Grimm fairy tale woven into gothic horror, and if you want to take Curse of Strahd, an epic level 10 campaign, and crank it to 11, you're going to introduce this quest. Trust me on it. Now, before we get started, huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. It's your support that really encourages me. You've been so uh, fun and engaging in our Discord channel, sharing ideas and thoughts. Um, one in particular, uh, Krog on it has been very helpful in editing some of this content you're going to be seeing in this particular one and sharing some ideas. So I really, really appreciate it. Now, as you may know, I put all of the stuff you see in this video into a detailed PDF guide, which is downloadable for all the Patreon members. And if you're using Foundry, you don't have to do all the work that I've, I've done it for you. You can just install the Foundry Adventure module and everything you see here you can enjoy in Foundry. So if you're interested in becoming a Patreon member, there's a link down below in the description description, patreon.com forward slash Pyram King. Now, a couple of other very important people that help put all of this together. Uh, well, my partner and collaborator in this journey of Curse of Strahd, DM Andy. DM Andy is making these gorgeous battle maps. He's gracious to allow us to include them in the Foundry modules and in this video. Now, if you're on another VTT platform, perhaps Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds or playing at home, these maps are available with grid, non-grid, day, night, and weather effects. You can print them out even. Um, go over to DM Andy's Patreon page. There's a link down below to him. And also give him a big, huge shout out and thanks because he's really made this a special campaign. In addition, James RPG Art, who does the gorgeous matte digital paintings that we're going to be showing here, he's very nice, allowing us to include the WebP versions of those in Foundry and in this video. However, if you want the high resolution ones or the animated ones, which I highly recommend, I'm a Patreon member of his as well, go check him out. There's a link down below uh, to James RPG Art's Patreon. And last but not least, and very importantly, is Blair in the Scene Packer module. The video, the modules would not even exist if it wasn't for Blair and his Scene Packer module. If you're interested in making your own adventures, uh, for Foundry, visit Blair's Patreon down below. He's also on our Discord channel, can answer any of your questions as well. You're going to need, by the way, um, Monk's Active Tile and Quick Encounters modules for this. You don't need them, but if you want to do some of the things in here that I'm going to demonstrate in here, some little cool functionality, those two modules will be required. Now, Let's go ahead and jump into this, shall we? Now, the first thing you're probably asking yourself, you know, what is this long-haired freak on YouTube talking about? Because I just bought Chris Estrada. I've thumbed through it. I've looked through the index. There is no epic major fey quest in here. Well, I would beg to dig or differ. You need to dig through there and figuratively really dig because between those words and between those lines you're going to find these little nuggets these stone circles and these gems and these references in there but truth be told you're right it is not written in curse of strahd on dnd beyond or in the book in fact it was one of the big three fan content providers dragna carta who put this initially all together now dragna carta saw these things in here and put an amazing quest line together i have a link down to his patreon which I'm a member of, as well as his, his Reddit post on the initial Fey quest. And other fans, such as myself and, and others, have expanded on it. And when I read the Dragna Cardus Fey quest, there was something that really resonated with me. And I'm going to tell you what it is, because it is these reasons, these three reasons in which I think this particular quest is the epic storyline quest that needs to be included to Curse of Stride, cranking it up to 11. So let's talk about what those three particular issues are. Now, the first thing is, is the unspoken antagonist in it. Now, we all focus our attention on Strahd. And sure, he is the big, badass, evil dude, right? I mean, even if we're using like a CR-27 version of him. 
But remember, he's an individual and he's the Dark Lord. He can only multitask so much. I mean, he's got his Tatiana thing going on, his Irina fetish, Baba Lazaga, all these kinds of headaches going on. And if your party shows up in Barovia, heads over to the Blood and Vine, starts pounding some ale, he's, he's not going to care. It's not until you get in his way that he's going to mess with you. However, the other unspoken antagonist in here affects everybody in Barovia, including your party all of the time, and that is the mists. See, if your party's sitting there pounding some ale and they want to go over to Water Deep, they can't leave, right? They got to go deal with Strahd in order to lift the mist. In fact, you could look at it as, well, Strahd is a means to an end. I got to defeat Strahd to lift the mist so I can go home. Well, there is a problem with that. Because if you do defeat Strahd, he kind of turns into the mist, and sure, you can take off, but the mists come back, Strahd resurrects, and, well, Barovia turns into the shitty gloom hole it has been for the last several centuries. Well, what if you could permanently lift the mist and permanently kill Strahd? Well, the Fey quest allows you to do that. Number two, locations. Now, when I first played this, it wasn't Curse of Strahd, it was Ravenloft back in the 80s, and we had one little village and a castle on the hill, and we'd go in there, and, well, my, my three-hit-point thief didn't make it very far. I had to roll up a new character. But besides that, Curse of Strahd has really expanded the lore, expanded the locations. We've got Kresk and, and Argenvoss, Holt, Brez, the Amber Temple, all of this amazing, amazing content. And what Wizards of the Coast did, which I really love, is introduce and expand upon one of the best mechanics in role-playing games, and that's the Taroka deck. In fact, I wrote an entire 50-page guide for it. There's a link down below, free guide for you if you want to uh, learn more about it. But what's cool about the Taroka deck is we take these magic items and we scatter them about Barovia and the Taroka deck predicts through the card reading where are these magic items that we will need to defeat Strahd. You know, the sun sword, the symbol of Ravenkind, even a fated ally. But there is one thing that's wrong with it. It's focused on items and fated allies, not necessarily locations. There's no gravity or importance to the location, it's just the item. I don't really care where the sun sword is. It could be an Argenvoss Holt, or it could be in the Abbey, or even, you know, in the Blue Water Inn. I just want the sun sword. So it doesn't really answer or give any um, importance or meaning to the actual locations. Of course, when we get there, there's some side quests, and there's some headaches going on there that we got to deal with, but really we're only going there to get a particular item. But what if these locations were important, critical to uh, solving this problem, getting rid of the mist, defeating Strahd once and for all, that these locations themselves became important and relevant? Well, the Fey Quest does that. Third, now I don't know if Curse of Strahd did, I mean, Wizards of the Coast did this on purpose or not. They could have. And this is one of the reasons I think Curse of Strahd is one of the best campaigns out there in the true sandbox is Wizards of the Coast left a lot of holes in it. I mean, there's a big chunk of the Amber Temple that has just nothing in it. We don't really know a lot of the backstories. There's so many broken threads and links and, and, and limited backstory, which is awesome for someone like myself or Dragna Carta or Mandy Mod or Lunch Break Heroes because... We can weave this magical narrative story into the campaign. It gives us so much to work with. Well, what if we wanted to answer who Baba Lazaga was? Who built the Amber Temple? What are those druids doing building that wicker man down at Yester Hill? I mean, all of those things, you know, are interesting and important part of lore. If we can weave all of that story together and give kind of purpose and reasoning to the history of Barovia and introduce that to the player and make that part of the quest in the storyline, well, wouldn't that be amazing? Well, it does. It happens with the Fey Quest. So the Fey Quest addresses those three items, dealing with the mist and permanently defeating Strahd and becoming technically heroes of the valley. Number two, addressing locations, making locations actually important other than just Ravenloft. And number three, well, it weaves together a great story and lore that really brings your, your players and gets them invested into the actual story, Curse of Strahd, rather than just being a participant there. Those are the three critical reasons why I think this is an epic quest. 
Now, you know how it started with Dragna Carta. You know the three items and why I think this is an epic quest, but you're still going, what is this quest? Well, let me give you the elevator pitch, the nickel tour, okay? So very simply, there are three stone circles like Stonehenge in Barovia. Each of these stone circles represents a celestial being known as a fae. Think of like a fairy, like Mother Nature. And each three of these magic celestial beings created a magic gem that were buried at each of the three stone circles. Collectively, these three fae, celestial beings, and their magic circles and gems brought harmony and peace and nature to the valley. It wove together the, the, the balance of nature between the plants and the humans and the animals and the land. It was a beautiful valley that was brought together by this kind of fey druid type magic. Well, one day this dark lord, Strahd, showed up and, well, he saw them as a huge threat to him. So he ordered his minions to desecrate, destroy the shrines, to find the gems and to capture those fey. Right? They're too powerful to let, you know, for him to let roam around in Barovia. Well, the Fae hid those gems, they went and disappeared, and the stone circles have been destroyed. Meanwhile, Strahd, in his castle, he has his own magic powerful gem called the Heart of Sorrow. And the Heart of Sorrow serves two purposes. Number one, it gives him extra power. And number two, it's his phylactery. If he gets killed, he can use it to resurrect himself. Now that Heart of Sorrow is super powerful. No mere mortal weapons, even mortal magic, nothing that your party has can destroy the Heart of Sorrow. Sure, they might be able to defeat Strahd, and, but he'll get to resurrect again. So in order to destroy the Heart of Sorrow, the players need to find the three gems, go to each of the three stone circles, consecrate the shrines, bring the celestial beings back, who give them a powerful weapon so that they could march up with that weapon, destroy the Heart of Sorrow, then defeat Strahd. Strahd can't resurrect the, the mist lift, and the hero, your party becomes the heroes of Barovia forever after. That's it. Three stone circles, find the three gems, restore the three magic beings. They give you a magic weapon to destroy the uh, Strahd's uh, flag tree, allows him to resurrect. Once that destroyed, you can take out Strahd you know, actually win the game and become heroes. That's it in a nutshell. Now, there's a lot, of, it seems like there's a lot of lore and content there, and there is, and the question you might be asking is, how do I introduce all of that to my players? And the answer is very, very simple. We have a player handout, a book, called The Fanes of Barovia. In fact, it was a, a story, a mythical story in the oral tradition for centuries and was eventually put down in this book. And it tells you this mythical kind of uh, Brothers Grimm fairy tale about the Fays and, and Strahd. Now, I think it's so important at this point um, that I either read it to you, you read it yourself, because it's gonna put everything else into perspective. It's gonna give it context to the meeting and you're gonna go, oh, I get it now. So. There's a link down in the description to, uh, below to the PDF. You can download it. It's a you know, three, four minute read. It's got some lovely pictures in it. Or you can watch me read it here because I think it's that important. And perhaps you like my voice. If you don't, hit pause, go download it and read it and come back. So let me bring it up here. And where do we got it? There we go. All right. So the Fanes of Barovia, this is a PDF handout. Again, it's free, you can go ahead and download it right now. I'm just gonna read it to you and you can look at the lovely pictures and listen to my voice. Here lies the Druic story of Ba Le Saga, which means the saga of the three, about the three Fae who in ancient times cared for the lands of Barovia and nurtured them as a mother loves and nurtures her own child, the Holy Fanes Three. Before people lived in the valley known as Barovia, three celestial beings, the Fae sisters, collectively oversaw the flora, fauna, and land. Together in their unity, they were the mother nature caring for the valley, and each of the Fae sisters provided their love and care over the valley. The forest Fae oversaw the plants and the animals. The water Fae oversaw the rain, the lakes, and the rivers. And the mountain Fae oversaw the land and the earth. Together they created a balance and harmony through the seasons. And when the first people came to the valley, the people learned of the, the three fae. 
the people respected the Fay and saw them as their goddesses and took care that took care of the valley. As the people learned to walk in harmony with nature, they created an order to pay tribute and respect to the natural balance, for the people were the guests of both the valley and the Fay. This order of druids created three circles, stone circles known as fanes, each representing one of the Fay. The first stone circle or fane was built on the edge of the forest as a tribute to the forest Fay. Another fane was built along the river as a tribute to the water Fay. And the third fane was built on a hill looking up towards the grand mountains to the mountain Fay. During the longest day of summer, the summer solstice, when the sun was at its zenith, the druids would arrive each of the fanes and lay flowers around the stones and thank the fay for the wonderful spring. And on the longest night, the winter solstice, the druids would light candles and bring fresh, warm loaves of bread as a gift to keep the fay warm during the long winter's night. Barovia was rich in lust. A fertile mountain valley was frequently covered with clouds and mist, which kept the flora healthy and beautiful. But it was a conundrum for the people trying to track the planting seasons using the sky. Over time, the Fae realized the people and their druid order were also part of the cycle of life in the valley. And the Fae ventured into a mountain full of amber. They discovered amber had a magical property, for it could harness magic and power. Each fay collected a shard of amber from the mountain and created a fay gem, placing a portion of their celestial magic into each of these gems. The fay left the gem at their respective fay stone circles, instructing the druids to bury them under the stones. The gems buried under the fay would provide a sign, a glyph, that would glow four times a year. The spring equinox, the summer solstice, the autumn equinox, and the winter solstice. The fane glyphs helped the druids to guide the farmers and the ranchers of Barovia and inform them when to plant and when to harvest. It also told them when to take their herds up to the fresh summer pastures and when to bring them home for winters. For centuries, the people lived in harmony with nature in the valley and felt blessed by the Fae. Four times a year, the Druids would bear gifts and seek the signs of the Fanes at the stone circles, and the Druids would recite a poem to, for each of the Fae as part of the ritual. The gifts to the Fae's. In spring equinox, they would bring the tesser flower. In the summer solstice, a bunch of Barovian grapes. In the autumn equinox, a bushel of red barrel uh, Barovian apples. And in the winter solstice, a loaf of bread made from Barovian wheat. It was no secret that the Fae sisters had a soft spot for newborn babies, and they were known to occasionally follow the cries of newborn out in the wilds to visit new mothers in the rural areas. Once there, they would fawn over the baby for a bit and wish the mother and child well and then leave them in peace. On the rare occasions, if a baby was born in spring, newborn fawns would accompany the Fae to visit the newborn babies, unifying and binding the people and the animals of the valley. Centuries drifted by without warning, and dark powers invaded the valley. The Fae and Druids together fought against the dark powers, but realized they could not defeat them. The Fae shared the knowledge of the powerful magic in the Mountain of Amber with the Druids. If the powerful An Amber could harness Fae's magic, it may harness the dark powers plaguing the valley. The Fae and Druids harnessed every ounce of the magical amber within the mountain and created a secret temple to imprison the darkness far away from the valley and the people. A young Druid named Kazan became the first custodian of the amber temple, keeping the secret and serving to protect the valley from darkness. Kazan learned magic, becoming a great wizard, and trained other Druids become, to become wizards and join the secret order to protect the amber temple and her secrets. Kazan eventually returned to the valley, living out his life in his lone tower, studying magic and offering his knowledge to those who sought it. And the Amber Temple became the greatest secret of the valley. Centuries had passed, and eventually the Druids and those in the valley forgot about the Amber Temple and their brethren wizards who protected it in the snow-covered mountains. When the first kings arrived to Barovia, they brought with them their religion of the Morning Lord. Churches were erected, and the king was blessed by the Morning Lord to rule over the people. 
The morning lord cherished his beautiful sunrises, so he saw to it to pervasive mist in Barovia were regularly burned off. This made the farmer's crops grow stronger and taller, but slowly the native lush plant life of Barovia was scorched and began to wither. Eventually, the people of the valleys forgot about the Fae and paid their tribute to the king and the morning lord for safety. They built walls around their villages to protect them from the wilderness and the feign evils preached to them by the church of the morning lord. The Druids, with their beliefs no longer welcomed in the villages, moved away to a small grove in the far corner of Barovia and left the fledgling kingdom to its own fate forevermore. The Druids continued to pay tribute to the Fae and the farmers in secret, not to disrespect the king or the morning lord, also paid tribute to the Fae, for they knew the Fae were the guardians that protected the land and provided harmony within the valley. The Fae took no interest in the worlds of men, for uh, men who lived behind their walls and praying to their gods. For the Fae in the valley were here long before the kings arrived, and they would be in the valley long after the kings were gone. The Great War. A prince arrived in the valley with his army to claim the land his kingdom. His army was mighty. His focus and aptitude for battle was great. The war brought destruction to the valley, and for the first time, the Fays took notice of man's grave destruction upon the land itself. When the war was over, the prince stood victorious and claimed the land his own. The Fays saw darkness festering in the prince, darkness that they had once thought long forgotten and imprisoned in the Amber Temple. The morning lord was exiled, and the mist returned to the lands of Brovia with a vengeance. They rolled in and meshed in with a thick black smoke of war that hung heavy in the Brovian air and clung to its trees. It created a thick gray mist covering the lands in a cold gray pallor. The mist diminished the phase magic terribly and unbalanced their connection to the lands and the cycle of life itself. There was something else. Undefinable, the mists seemed to have a mind of their own. The mist encompassed the valley, and the cycle of life slowed. The budding signs of life in spring were gone. The animals were born with hollow eyes of darkness. Flowers no longer blossom, and eggs were black. New horrid creatures emerged from the woods. Flowers died, and crops began to rot, and the land turned dark. The signs of darkness were also seen in the villages, as babies were born who would not laugh or cry, and some believed they were soulless. When the Fae discovered these final turns of events, they became deeply disturbed and even frantic. Their pleas to higher powers went unanswered, and something was very, very wrong with the natural order. The Fae believed that the cold of the darkness surrounding the prince gave birth to these terrible mists. It was said that the prince had lost his only brother and his true love during the Great War. The prince's heart was full of darkness and sorrow and nothing else. He spent extended tracts of time searching for the body of his lost love, and his heart was a bottomless pit of despair. The prince's bearing was such that it affected everything around him. So heavy was the burden of his loss that it cast a great darkness over the land and it affected the mist itself. The Fae believed that they would need to restore the prince's heart and lift the darkness that surrounded him to heal the mist that blanketed the valley and strangled the life from the land. The Fae decided to create a magical gift that the for the prince that would lift the sorrow from his heart, the heart of sorrow. The Fae broke their gems in half and used some of their remaining power to meld the three halves together to create a great artifact and form the heart of sorrow. The Fae poured all their love of life in the valley into the gem and gave it magical properties that could absorb the sorrow and darkness from the heart of the prince. The Water Fae took human form and traveled to the prince's castle to bring him this great gift, the Heart of Sorrow. The Water Fae explained how the prince's heavy heart perverted the mist which covered the lands of darkness. She explained that, they, they, that the crafted gift by the three Fae's sister's gems with powerful magic would lift this sorrow from his heart. He would be free of the despair and the remorse that shackled him, and it would restore the land, and the kingdom would rejoice. The prince was pleased with the gift and the magical power of the Heart of Sorrow, which invigorated the prince with unbridled zeal and swift decision-making. 
The prince had heard of the fabled Fay, and he had previously given them no mind during the Great War, thinking them only a myth. However, upon learning of their power and the gems, he could not let them roam free. He imprisoned the water fate and ordered his minions to desecrate the fane stone circles and find the other half of these three gems and to capture the fay. A raven sitting in the window of the castle overheard what, overheard what took place between the prince and the water fay. It was no ordinary raven, it was a were raven. The were raven flew faster than the prince's orders could travel and warned the two fay and the druids, for the prince was the darkness, and he had sent his minions to destroy the fay and stone circles to find the gems and capture the remaining fay sisters. The mountain and forest fay dug up their gems together and went to the fay and stone circle on the shores of the river near Berez. But the prince's minions had already desecrated the fane of the water fay, and the blue gem was now missing. Fearing the blue gem was in the hands of the dark prince and their sister his prisoner, they needed to find others to come to their aid. But with the villagers of Barovia no longer believing in the fay, for generations they had worshipped the morning lord, and now they paid tribute to their new lord of Barovia, the Dark Prince. With only two gems, their sister locked away, and their fanes desecrated, they hid the two remaining gem gems. The forest fate entrusted her green gem with the were-raven who had proven honorable and loyal. And the mountain fay entrusted her red gem with the old wizard who lived in the tower, whom she had become to know and to trust. Their next course had become more difficult than their dwindling powers could bear. They needed to obtain the blue gem and rescue the water fate and restore the stone circles. Only then could the three fay and their gems be brought together to defeat the dark prince. They needed to find others who were trustworthy, strong, and had the fortitude to face the Dark Prince and his minions. But there was no one in the valley they could turn to, and they, could, they would have to find truly powerful and stout rebels to aid them. The Fae would hide from the Dark Prince and his minions until they could find the agent strong enough to resist the Dark Prince, then deputize them with aid in their battle against this corrupt master tactician. The forest fae transformed into a human and lived among the people of Velaki. She kept her eyes and ears open, looking for those who could provide aid and watching over those who would serve the Dark Prince. And the mountain fae disappeared in search of those brave enough to aid them and face the Dark Prince. The Dark Prince underestimated the power of the water fae. She escaped the prison in the catacombs, and during her escape, she found the skull of a great dragon she once knew, the dragon Argenvost, who the Dark Prince had killed. She used the remaining magic she could draw upon and cast a powerful spell of flying on the skull and sat upon the dragon skull flying from the castle to go warn her sisters. When she arrived, her sisters had vanished. The fanes were desecrated and destroyed, and the gems were gone. She searched the forest and the mountains, but to no avail. When the Dark Prince learned the Water Fae had escaped and took his greatest prize, the skull of his adversary, Argenvost, he filled with rage. He called upon dark magic to lay waste to the village of the river Berez, which paid homage to the Water Fae as a warning to all Barovians. The Fae were enemies of the Dark Prince. Any village that prayed, paid tribute, or honored the Fae would be destroyed. The river rose and flooded the once beautiful village of Berez, and over time, Berez, Berez became ruins and the surrounding area became a swamp. The Dark Prince, in his cruelty, cursed the Water Fae to become the Swamp Fae, so that no one but the nasty creatures that inhabited the swamp would pay homage to her. There we go, that's Berez. The Water Fae, now the cursed Swamp Fae, returned to her Fane Stone Circle and the ruins of Brez that lay in the swamp. Time passed and she grew bitter and angry, but without her gem and her sister, she had little power. The Water Fae traveled up to the Amber Temple in the mountains and vested upon the dark powers that were imprisoned there. She sought the powers held deep in the Amber Temple to defeat the Dark Prince and to restore the valley. As she scoured the catacombs of the temple and the caverns of amber, she became obsessed and corrupt with the dark powers. Her body twisted and contorted as she made pacts with the dark powers, which the valley had long forgotten. And when she emerged from the amber temple, she was no longer the lovely water fay, but now the deformed, grotesque 
creature. She returned to the ruined swamps of Berez and practiced her newfound dark magic, creating creatures of darkness and a race of frog people known as the Bullywog to serve her. She had made pacts with the witches and the swamp hags who were her spies in Barovia. Other dark creatures roamed the swamp, some having run afoul of her dark experiments. Some believe she's raising an army of swamp creatures to destroy the Dark Prince and even the villages of men who she blames for all that has happened. It is believed the Swamp Fae has taken the name Baba Lazaga as her own with a fiendish pride. And that's it. That's the Fanes of Barovia. And I think you can see at this point that this uh, short story, five pages there, gives you a lot of context What's interesting about the story, it doesn't mention Ravenloft or, or Strahd himself. He's just referred to as a dark prince. The, the players will figure it out. But it gives some purpose and understanding to these stone circles, the stuff that happened you know, hundreds of centuries ago, uh, what the Amber Temple was, what is this amber itself, and how are those dark powers stored in those, in those vestiges of, of, of amber. We learn about a couple of locations about the Fanes and even who Bab al is. Now, let's go ahead and jump into this. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a, a quick look at the clues to the fanes. So what I've done for you as the DM is, um, first of all, let's talk about this book. So you got this Bain, this fanes of Barovia book. My suggestion is to get it to the players as early as possible. In fact, you could get it to the players before session one. It could be a family heirloom that's handed out to one of the player characters. It could be something that the players had found in a previous adventure. Um, you could use it as some sort of player hook. Or you could introduce it in the library in Death House, or my version called the Count's Manor, or in the Burgermeister of Barovia's home. But you want to give this, this book to them early on in the campaign because it's kind of this book that'll be kind of their field guide. You know, it's the lore and the history. It's what everybody kind of knows uh, in the valley. It's the myth of, of Barovia itself, but it's the groundwork for the quest. Now, what this does here is this gives you guides so when the players are trying to figure stuff out in the book, you know what it is. So the, the Fane Circles, we know there's a clue, it's the forest, and there's a quote from the book. Or the Water Fane, it's near the river in Berez, and here's the two quotes from the book. So this helps you know maybe a player is a little lost or the party's a little lost. You know where in the book this is. You could, you know, you could have an NPC or some kind of clue to lead them maybe and, or give them some realization. But the book has all the clues in it. I also have a whole section here on the locations. Um, of, of the, where the Fey are. We know that the Forest Fey is in Vlaki. She's taken human form. The Mountain Fey is unknown. And the Swamp Fey, well, that's Baba Zaga, the Water Fey. The gems, um, we know some information about the gems here. We have also some clues about the gems, of where ravens took the, uh, uh, the green gem. Uh, the players will eventually find out the Martikoff family are were ravens, and they'll eventually put those clues together. We'll go through that clue cycle there. The red gem, we know references to this wizard tower, that's Van Richten's tower, and references to the Amber Temple. So that's going to connect them there. That young druid Kazan, remember, started the Amber Temple, and then he was in the wizard's tower, and the, and the mountain fae gave him the red gem. But the blue gem, there's really nothing in this book. I mean, nobody found it. The face didn't find it. We don't know if the prince found it. We'll talk about that. The ritual clues are all in here. There's uh, four items during the four different times of the year. The tesser flower, Barovian grapes, Barovian apples, and bread. And there's some uh, uh, rituals and some poems. So all, this whole thing helps you as the DM know what's in that book that helps guide those players. So if the players are having any problems, you can do a quick, this is like a quick reference for you. Okay, what happens next is the players, we're going to be adding additional card readings by Madam Ava for the three red gems. So let's bring that up right now and talk about that. So when you get to Madam Ava, and if you're going to introduce this later on, Madam Ava can give them a second card reading, maybe, maybe Madam Ava or another Vistani, or maybe the Vistani Velocke can, can give them another card reading. Um, and I put some um, language in here. If the party does have the book, you know, she'll say, Ah, young stout adventurers seeking knowledge of the legendary Fey. You seek the magic gems of the Fey, lost forever they are. Perhaps the cards will reveal a clue to their location. 
if you are the ones who are meant to find it. Now, if they haven't found the book, the Fane, or they don't have it, she's going to refer to it that they should get it. The mists have trapped you here. Seek out the book of the Fanes of Barovia. In there is held the knowledge to escape Barovia. You must find the three gems to restore the Fanes as described in the book. The cards may reveal clues to the gems, but you must also seek out the book. Now, here's the card reading, and I have the cards also marked in here. So... She's gonna do the red, the green, and then finally the blue. We'll talk about the blue has an interesting mechanic that I've thrown in there. So she does the red card, um, and she's, for the red card, she, she's gonna flip over the wizard card or the master of stars, and she's, she's gonna say, the red gem of the fabled mountain fay is powerful indeed. Let us see what the card reveals. Ah! The Master of Stars, the card of the great wizard. Wise men are not wise at all times. Seek the Lone Tower for your answer to the location of the Red Gem. So the Lone Tower obviously is the tower outside of Kresk. In there we've got some stuff with Busty and some other cool mechanics in there that we'll talk about where they'll lead them to the Red Gem. The Green Gem, she'll say, Ah, the Green Gem of the lovely Forest Fay is strong with the spirits of the animals and the birds. Ah, the raven card, how interesting. Ghastly grim, an ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, quoth the raven nevermore. Not all creatures are what they seem. So the raven card itself should be a clue. You're cluing in raven, where raven from the book. She says not all creatures are what they seem. Where raven So there's some interesting little clues in there. By the way, that was a quote from, obviously, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, quote the raven nevermore. The last one is the blue gem, and it's rumored to be lost forever. And what I introduced it here was a mechanic to allow you, the dungeon master, to decide where to hide the blue gem. Now, there's two ways you can do that. You can uh, hide it yourself, decide what location of the six locations I have in here. I have a bunch of clues for each of those locations. Or an optional way to do it randomly is you can pull out these six cards from the tarot deck, shuffle them, and then turn over the one that is associated with, with uh, the, the hidden location of the blue gem. And both you, the DM, and the players will both be surprised. It'll be kind of entertaining. So let's go through this. This is the last gem. And this gem has some gravitas to it because it's related uh, also to the water fair or Baba Lazaga. And this is what she says. She says, to destroy evil's heart, you must find its counterpart. The last gem you seek, the road not for meek, lost its way from its fay. The cards will tell where the gem fell. So there's a little bit of tips in there. To destroy the evil heart, that's the heart of sorrow, you must find its counterpart. That'll be the gems being put together. We'll talk about that. Now, here are the locations. Argenvoss Holt, that's the adventure card. If she turns that over, she's going to say, What you seek hides in the dragon's keep. Argenvoss Holt is clearly the dragon's keep. Argenvoss was the silver dragon. Uh, Ravenloft will be the prison card, and she's going to say, Dark is the tomb, lies a queen in gloom, a dead son and another one, her heart broken, a gem but a token. You're going to see some clues that will make a lot of sense to that one. That's pretty cool. The stone's actually hidden in uh, the crypt of the queen, uh, the blue gem. The third one is the abbey. It's the healer card. And she's going to say, A healer of sorrow now rests in snow. Her secrets with her no one knows. This is Sister Constance. She's buried in the abbey. She's also buried with the raven kind. There's some other uh, lore and stuff for the raven kind item there. That's pretty cool. Then we have the Gitrog. I added the uh, Gitrog. It's an additional module part of Lake Zarovich. There's a Gitrog cave. It's a great treasure hunt. So the blue stone could be with the Gitrog. And she'll say, she'll turn over the beast card and she'll say, A frog the size of the beast. No one not knows not what it eats. So she's, it's definitely a beast, some kind of giant frog. The next one is the village of Yadrag. Now, this is an addition, again, by Dragon Carta that will be included in a module. Dragon Carta added another village up in the mountains near Salinka Pass, so we included that location in there if you're going to be running uh, Dragon Carta stuff. Um, 
A village in the mountain long forgotten, an elder awaits to tell of fates. And he's referring, she's referring to Elder Ormer, who is the elder in the village, who will have the knowledge and the information of the stone. And the last one is going to be in the monument in the swamp itself, and it's going to be the mist card. And she's going to say, A forgotten tribute to a lover lost stands in stone among swamp ruins and all alone. So there you have it. You're, you, she's going to give you three additional readings for each of the gems. The blue one gives you the option to hide that gem in six locations, or you can hide it wherever you want. Um, but I have clues for those particular six locations. All right, let's talk about the actual gems themselves. So I have, what I've done in here is I've really made this broken down into different sections. So we've got the blue gem, and we've got the green gem, and we've got the red gem. So let's talk about the, the, uh, the red gem was obviously created by the Mountain Fae. Um, the red gem is, is hidden in area 31 of the Amber Temple. So when you're on the Amber Temple map on the lower floor, the whole bottom half of that map is just a huge, huge uh, catacomb that has nothing in it. You know, rules of written, it just says, you know, empty catacomb, nothing there, pretty much. Uh, it's, it's Area 31. Now, what's happened is Kazan has gone there. He, took, he takes the red gem there. He builds that part of the catacomb to store the red gem. And then on east, uh, the east and west wings of that catacomb, he's built smaller chambers to store the other two gems for if they need to get them and keep them from straw. The problem is, is well, this is the, a big reveal in this, is um, the Lich, uh, Exanthatar, is... Kazan, he's just forgotten who he was. So if uh, the players um, uh, get there and they restore uh, Exanathar's memory, he re he'll remember being Kazan, being given this red gem, and he'll give the players the password to open up the secret door in Area 31 to get the gem. Otherwise, the players are gonna have to go in there when you do the Amber Temper mo module, I have a bunch of booby traps and, and creatures in there, so it's gonna be kind of exciting trying to get that, that red gem. And it allows for some great role playing between uh, the players um, and the Lich, who is also uh, playing into the whole rules as written of him forgetting his memory. He's actually Kazan. Um, we also have some clues to find the red gem here, and so let's talk about it. Obviously in the book, he trusted to the, to the wizard the card reading here. And we have this um, book, um, is includes the, uh, the Fae Circle of Teleportation spell. There's a symbol of the Mountain Fae and it tells of the tune to protect the gems in the temple uh, in this book. And we'll be including that. This book can be found, uh, it's not really a book, it's a, it's a spell scroll um, in Van Richten's or the Wizard's Tower. Or it can also be found with Viktor Velakovich uh, in Velaki in the Attic. You remember, he is trying to use a teleportation spell. That spell that he's trying to use and he's killing people with, we'll be covering. That's the Yef uh, Rissel uh, spell, which we'll talk about. Busty, who is a play and expansion on um, Lunch Break Heroes, Buster, um, has a little story to tell about the wizard leaving uh, and heading off to the Amber Temple. So there's an entire speech here. So when they do get there, it'll send them to the Amber Temple. So you're gonna have the the scroll and the uh, busty tell them about the Amber Temple. And in addition, you have Eldar Ormer Om who knows the Fae rituals and he also can direct them to the Amber Temple. So those are several different clues that will direct the players to the Amber Temple, eventually getting there, dealing with the Lich, finding and getting the Red Gem. So the Red Gem is hitting in Area 31 of the Amber Temple, and there's a bunch of clues here to help your players uh, find their way to the Amber Temple. Most likely they'll get to the Wizard's Tower first. The Green Gem, obviously, was given to the Were Raven, and um, the Were Raven clan is Vinshaw. There is a character named Muriel Vinshaw. Um, she's mentioned in the other modules. She's one of the Were Ravens at the Bone Grinder. She is second in command of the Keeper of Feathers. She's known as the Master of Feathers, which is the Were Raven cult. She is also secretly um, very close friends with the Forest Fae, who's living in Vlaki. She is the eyes and ears of the Forest Fae. Uh, in Velaki. Now, the green gem was entrusted to the were-raven centuries ago. The were-raven 
um, has been passing it down through their generations. And it's buried, it was initially buried and for centuries underneath the Wizard of Wine. So underneath the vineyard, if you look at the uh, official map, you can see in the cellar, there's kind of like a crack in the cellar and an earthen wall in there. That's where the green gem was hidden. However, uh, when the players arrive at the Wizards of Wine, it's going to be overrun with the Druids. The Druids from Yester Hill have stolen the green um, gem, the Forest Fay gem, has taken it to Yester Hill, and they have a giant wicker man in which they've placed the green gem. They're bringing it to life to first march against men and eventually against Strahd. The, the Druids there are obviously upset uh, about Strahd. So um, when the players get to the Wizards of the Wine, the green gem will be missing. Um, they'll, they'll miss it. Uh, no matter when, when they get to it in the campaign, um, that'll trigger that timer where they've just missed the green gem. The green gem has been taken by the druids to Yester Hill to get that wicker man going. There's a whole module with the wicker man and the druids that you will see. Um, the clues here, obviously, you've got the Madame Ava's card reading and what's in the book. And when the Wizard of Wines, when they get to the Wizards of Wines, they will tell them that it's been stolen by the druids. You have the Keepers of Feather, which are the uh, were ravens in Velaki, who also know um, where the green gem is, because everybody's going to believe it's going to be in the Wizards of Wines. Muriel Finshaw believes it's in the Wizards of Wine. In fact, even Lila, by the way, you know, the big reveal, I just blew that here, but Lila, the, the mushroom tea lady in Velaki, she is the, the forest fae. Um, she is the one that has uh, given them the, the green gem, and she still believes it's in the Wizards of Wine. And so will Elder Ormer. So when the players get to the Wizards of Wine, they're going to realize it's been stolen and taken down to Yester Hill. And next we have is the Blue Gem. And the Blue Gem, we have six different locations. So in the Blue Gem guide here, we have all the different six locations. And each one of these locations has a backstory of how the Blue Gem got there. So with the Argenvost Holt backstory, it was Sir Godfrey that sought revenge on Strahd after the fall of Argenvost in order, after hearing Strahd's decree against harboring the Fae and capturing the Water Fae, he goes and it is Sir Godfrey that digs up the gem and he brings it back to Argenvost's Holt. Now, if the players go to Argenvost's Holt, he's going to ask the players to return the skull of Argenvost and he will give them the, the blue gem. So it is kind of a quest. Get the, the Return the skull of Argenvost and I will relinquish the blue gem. There are some clues here as well. We have the book, The Fall of Argenvost, which I've recently updated, which has references uh, to the story I just mentioned. Uh, Sir Godfrey, if you see him, he will tell you uh, the cursed swamp fae, Baba La Saga, is the water fae, and uh, you'll need the red, the blue gem to restore her, um, and he knows where it is. He's not going to tell you where it is. He needs you to go get that skull of Argenvost, and then he will turn it over to you. It's actually hidden. Uh, in the the bedroom of it's in room uh, Q42. It's Argenvoss, the dragon's actual bedroom. It's hidden under the floorboards. That's where where Sir Godfrey hid it centuries ago. Um, and then there's also a Vistani lore, a myth, and they'll say the ghost knights of the dragons keep harbor many secrets. Some believe they even have one of the fabled fey gems. So they'll send them to the dragon's keep. Um, the next location is Ravenloft for the Blue Gem. Um, there's a whole story on how the Blue Gem was taken, um, which we'll talk about. It's called a Soldier's uh, Note, which we have here. Um, the Blue Gem is actually hidden in area K88. It's the tomb of the king and queen, and it's the Blue Gem is resting in the queen's tomb. Um, Strahd uh, wanted to use these gems to try to revive his mother, breathing these gems would revive his mother. So if the if the if his minions did get the blue gem, they brought it back to Ravenloft, and the blue gem is in K88. Now, there is a special clue here, which is included, called the Soldier's Note, which, um, you know what, I'll go ahead and show it to you right now. How about that? Here is the Soldier's Note. So the Soldier's Note can be found uh, in various locations. It can be found in the bookstore, it can be found in the Wizard's Tower, it can be buried in the grave, found in Argenvost. Um, but here is the Soldier's Note, and I'm just going to, you know, because I like to read, I'll just read it to you, it's pretty short. Um, the Soldier's Note, a final testament of a dying soldier. I record these events of horror which have plagued my soul, for I once served a noble prince who ventured into darkness. 
I had been sent out with a master at arms and a few men to desecrate a pagan shrine that lay along the Luna River near the lovely village of Berez. We were ordered to search for a blue gem believing to contain mystical powers. Our lord and master had become obsessed with restoring his mother, the queen, since she had passed. He spent many of his waking hours in search for magic which, re which could restore her life. When the prince learned of these gems, he sent us venturing in search of them, and to destroy the pagan shrines, they were hidden. The prince believed that if he placed the magic gems in the queen's crypt, they may bring a renewed life to the once deceased. I shudder to think of such magic. The men grew wary of our lord as his spirit continued to darken. I was ordered to stand watch along the river, and my fellow men-at-arms searched the pagan stone circle for the blue gem, and then desecrated the once pagan site. I cannot say if the master-at-arms found that magic blue gem, but what happened after haunted me forever. As we ventured down the lunar river towards Velaki on our return to the castle, we were besieged by a monstrous beast of a kind I had never seen. The monster flipped our boat, sending us into the water. Men screamed as they panicked and attempted to swim ashore. I crawled up the muddy bank and looked back to see one of our men get swallowed whole by the beast. As it barked out a croaking sound so loud that I felt the ground shake. I ran, not looking back, to see if any fellow men had survived the ordeal, for I feared to return to Castle Ravenloft. The land had grown dark, and our lord and master was plagued with darkness at the loss of his brother, his mother, and the one that he loved. I spent the remaining years living as a farmer in a small apple orchard in the village of Cresk. I changed my name and married a woman from the village, never revealing my past. I write these words on my deathbed, so that I may die with a clear conscience, and so these events are never forgotten. And if you find these words, please forgive me and bless my soul, for I never wished to serve darkness, and prayed my remaining days to the morning Lord for forgiveness. Forgive my weakness, Ben Otvas, he crosses out his name, and he sends, Ensign Benjamin Octavius. So this note, Soldier's Note, which the players can find, you can put it anywhere you want to, actually covers two of the Blue Gem locations. It, does, it doesn't tell you if the Blue Gem does make it back to Ravenloft. He doesn't know. But it does show you where in Ravenloft it might be hidden, obviously in the Crypt of the Queen. It also references the Gitrog. So the Gitrog, if the Gitrog has it. So you can use this blue, blue, the Soldier's Note for either, either locations. It's a fun little add-in there. Um, the Vistani also have a story of Ravenloft. They say, a century ago, a lone soldier visited our camp. He says he was in, on an important mission for Lord Strahd, but was attacked by a giant beast in the water. He survived and had something he needed to return to the Lord Strahd. The Vistani took him across the lake to the Pillar of Ravenloft. It's at this point, you can, you can also decide whether you want to share the secret entrance to the Pillar of Ravenloft, which is included in two previous modules. Um, the Abbey location. Now, the Abbey is about Sister Constance. Uh, uh, while aiding the fallen Argenvoss, she received a young female Dusk Elf who gave her the Blue Gem. The Dusk Elf told Sister Constance no matter what, the Blue Gem must never fall into the hands of the Dark Lord Strahd. And Sister Constance would see in the eyes of the young woman the gravity of what she told her and promised the gem would be safe. The young female D Dusk Elf is Petrina, who was later taken by Strahd to be his br bride. Even though she resisted, she was eventually killed and freed by her brother. The Blue Gem is buried with Sister Constance in her grave. Uh, along with the symbol of Ravenkind. Now, there's some clues here. If the players visit Casimir at the Vistani camp, he will share this with the players. My sister dug up the Blue Gem when she heard the water fear was captured by Strahd. She came to me with the Blue Gem, but I knew it only would bring unwanted trouble from Strahd, and I instructed her to take it to Argenvostholt, for they would know what to do with it. She later told me she gave it to a sister from the Abbey who was providing aid to the Fallen Knights. So this ties in Argenvoss Holt as well as the Abbey. The Abbot will tell them, There are strange myths surrounding Sister Constance. She was believed to be an angel of some sort, or yet many believed. Yet she, if she was an angel, why would she be buried in the Abbey graveyard? So he actually references her, talks about some myths, and then references her in the graveyard. So it sends the players to the graveyard. There are some other stories here, obviously, by the Vistani and Elder 
Ormir that lead the players to the Abbey to find it. We have the Gitrog Cave. Uh, the Gitrog Cave, we already just covered the soldier's note, which talks about this giant beast who might have swallowed the soldier who had the blue gem. In addition, Darovich and Ragnar, those are the two hunters. Darovich runs the inn in Kresk. Ragnar runs the leathery uh, in Velaki. They both have a story to tell the players, and their story is, a long time ago, an old drunken man told the story of a hunter wandering in a cave by the lake and found a mound of treasure, including a large blue gem. A Gitrog, a fabled large beast, entered the cave, for it was the Gitrog's lair. The hunter barely escaped and later died, only to reveal the story. I know the cave near Lake Zarvich, and there have been some strange sightings. Perhaps the story is true. I know the location. So, Darovich and Ragnar can give the players the location of the Gitrog's cave. We also have, again, some more stories. The, a myth about the giant beast um, um, by the Vistani and Elder Ormer. Elder Ormer will be a constant... Um, source. He is the, the go-to elusive NPC in this entire quest, quest line because he knows the, the poems of the Fae, he knows the rituals of the Fae, and he knows some things to tell the players to send them to the proper places. That leads us to uh, Yardang, where he is. The village of uh, uh, Yadrag is up in the mountains, and the people were once great hunters of Barovia, um, and this ties into uh, Dragnacarta's quest line up there. Um, elder is the town elder and historian. He will tell the party lore, including the fabled blue gem. He knows of its location, but the party must kill either the Hezru, uh, which has been plaguing the village, and if it's already killed, the Shizuva, which has also been plaguing the village. So there's two monsters in Dragnacarta's uh, campaign. And what the elder can do is saying, you know, depending on which one you want to do on your campaign, gives you some freedom and liberty. If they kill one of them, bring proof of the kill, then Elder Omar will and proof of the kill. He will gift them the blue gem. It was entrusted to him. He will tell them that the Burgermeister of Berez, Laszlo Ulrich, centuries ago, traveled up to the mountains and gave Omar the, the gem for safekeeping so Strahd would not find it. Um, it was Omar that dug it up. And then there's some stories here Again, by Darovich and Ragnar, Ulrich the ghost in the ruins of Brez. If you run into him, he has a story about seeking out the elder up in the village uh, who knows about the phase. And then the Vistani as well have a myth about um, the, the elder in the village and the fae and the phase that are up in the mountain. Um, the last location for the Blue Drems is the swamps at Marina's Monument. Now, um, she was killed by Ulrich. Uh, and the legions. Um, the water fae escaped from Ravenloft, um, obviously with the skull. Uh, Ulrich is the one um, that dug up the gem, and he actually buries it under the monument of, of Marina. And so that's where it's, it's located. And there's some clues here. Uh, Muriel Venshaw, Godfrey, both talk about the story of Marina um, and how Marina used to go to the Stone Circle and pray to the water fae all the time. So the, the marina and the monument and the ghost of marina, when she was alive, she would frequently go across the river from Berez and pray to the water fae, the stone circle. So there was a, there's a huge connection between her and the water fae. So some of them see her ghost. Ulrich knows her from the past. And Sir Godfrey obviously knows what happened in the past. So there's several clues there. So you have all of these locations um, for the blue gem with all the different clues here depending on where you want to hide it. So let's go ahead and, by the way, there's the, the fame book is also in here if you want it, want it for your players. We're going to go in here now and we're going to cover, um, well, let's just see the, the gems. So we got each of the, well, that's the gems, but let me just show you the gems. So we have each of the gems in here so you can see them. There's the blue gem there. And each one of these items that the players can have there's a DM section, it's, it's secret, that has links back to the gem, the fae, and the water. We have the green gem here, here's the green gem, and we also have the red gem. So these are the three gems that they're gonna be looking for. Um, those are items uh, as well. Now, when they find the gem, they don't know exactly if it is the gem. It's gonna take an Arcana DC 20 check to realize it's a celestial gem and that it's also made from magic amber. So these are celestial gems, each one made from uh, um, amber,
but it takes an Arcana DC 20 check. Now, we're going to talk about um, the... I think we should just go to the Fane circles here. We're going to do the forest one first, uh, and I'm going to show you this here. So here is the... The Forest Fane itself, this is the the um, map the by James RPG Art, which is gorgeous. I always like to start my session with showing you the scene, and then we go right into the battle map scene. So here's the battle map um, for the fa Forest Fane, which is behind um, the Bone Grinder uh, or the Windmill. Now, when the players get here, they're going to, we got the, 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 the Forest Fane here, um, it's behind the bone grinder. There's a cave um, for the gem, and it's accessible through a small hole in the center, which has been covered by a large boulder. So there's a boulder here, which can be moved. You can see that. I'll just zoom in. There's a giant boulder here that which can be moved. And it's going to take uh, you know some athletic checks, pretty strong, a, a DC 20 to move it. An option that you can have in the absence of a party member with huge amount of strength, you can introduce like kind of a random local farmer NPC and he's coming by, you know, and he looks over there and obviously the farmer knows how to use block and tackle. He has his horse and his wagon and he can say, have you seen Boris? Hey, you're not from around here. And then players can engage this farmer to, to use some, maybe some block and tackle and some rope to pull this boulder off. And that opens up this hole that leads down below here to the cave down below. Now, when they get down to the cave, two things are going to happen. When the, the when the face see, I'm sorry, when the hags see them moving, trying to move this boulder, the hags are going to come up and try to attack. Now, that's if the players haven't already dealt with the hags, the bone, bone grinder. Here, you can have a secondary encounter with the hags at the top. Now, the hags have commandeered this faint circle as their own. They've scattered teeth around the mounds. They've turned this place into kind of a crap hole, you know, and they're worshiping um, um, uh, Kathleen of the Crooked Teeth. Now, just a historical reference, Kathleen of the Crooked Teeth is from Irish mythology. I have a link there if you're just interested in that. Um, but they have their own faith that they've been worshiping here. So they've desecrated uh, after straw desecrated, the hags have turned this into their own kind of private shrine near the bone grinder as they're worshiping their own um, the goddess, this uh, uh, Kathleen the Crooked Teeth. Now, if, if, they, if the hags aren't there, the players already killed them, or if they do kill them and they get into the cave, we get into the cave, the players are going to deal with um, a fell hound. And we got the fell hound right here. I'll just show you. Here is the fell hound and I'll just bring him in. So the fell hound is in the cave uh, and he will appear and attack the players. Now the fell hound has uh, a paralyzing breath um, here and he's going to try to use that first to try to paralyze 60 foot cone if he can and the, and the, and the players fail a constitution check uh, they're going to be paralyzed for a minute um, and they can continue to roll their, their saving throw. So that is his his action, and then he has a pretty terrific bite here. It's a uh, 1d8 plus 3 piercing. Now, he has the ability to go invisible, but he can only use it once per day. So in combat, if you want to use it, I would probably use the invisibility and then have the Felhan kind of come up behind somebody and then attack him again. So you only got a one shot on using the invisibility, um, and then the Felhan is, well, he's done. So let's talk about the ritual here at the Forest Fane. So we're inside the cave underneath the Forest Fane, and the, you've, you've dealt with your encounter with, the, with the, 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 the hound. You're gonna have to clean up this place. It's been turned into kind of a, a crappy shrine to the crooked teeth. So there's like a foul presence, uh, removing obviously the, the corpse of the, the fey hound, uh, cleaning off the altar up here, you know, it's got some old sacrifice and, and blood and ritual shit. And then there's two fires that you're going to want to light. Now, what I did in here is I have a button over here. It says to click to begin the ritual. So if you click this, all the lights come on here. That's kind of cool. And the ritual begins. So you have this ritual, and I have this music that you're going to play when the ritual comes on, which is the angelic fey music here. Here you go. So the players need to, to read this gem. Now, the, where are they going to get this poem? The poem can be um, picked up from Mariel Vinshaw, Lila, the mushroom tea lady, who is 
Obviously the Forest Fay, it's at the Blue Water Inn, the Martikoffs have it. Obviously the Elder knows it, and the Druids know all of the poems. Um, the poem is actually an item that they can pick up. And this particular poem is uh, the poem from uh, Orpheus by Shakespeare. So this creates some good role playing. The, the players, to complete the ritual, they're going to have to, to place the green gem uh, up on the, uh, the altar up here. So they place the green gem up there and then they read and along with the tribute. So you gotta know what time of year it is. Remember we have the spring, summer, um, uh, autumn and winter. So if it's spring, you're gonna have the tesser flower and there's notes in here, it's spring. It's found in the foothills of Barovia. And they're gonna place that on the altar along with the green gem and they're gonna read this poem, the Orpheus poem by William Shakespeare. Now once they complete reading this poem, um, the Fae will appear here, and I'll just bring her in to complete this entire transformation. Here is the Forest Fae, and so she arrives there. And when she arrives, what you want to describe is it's Lila, the Mushroom Lady. And if you do this right, and they don't know who Lila is, they don't know that Lila is the, the Forest Fae, this will, this, if you do this, it'll be a great secret. And then she, she first materializes as Lila, and then she slowly starts to become the Force Fae, and here's the Force Fae here. And she says to them, as she's slowly transforming into the Force Fae, I have kept a fond eye of, on each of you. I might even be guilty of sending up a silent prayer here and there, wishing you well. They do say that nobody's voice is louder in the ears than the gods of an elderly grandmother. Do you ever get to enjoy my mushroom tea? Now is not the time to speak at length, unfortunately. When they speak of Straw, they say that he is the land. Well, I think my sister would have something to say about that. But one thing is certain. Straw has eyes and ears everywhere. Our secrets will be safer if we proceed without delay. I will grant you power to finish the task to restore my sisters. Now, she, pre she presents this craft of special mushroom tea to the players, and if the players drink it, they immediately are fully healed. All of their injuries, all their curses, they're fully restored, full strength, everything. So as they restore her, she restores them. Now, she's going to give to the players, if they don't already have it, the face staff, and that's this right here. And when she hands to them the face staff, she's gonna say, the staff is imbued with the power of the forest and its ability to restore itself even from the most devastating of disasters. It is powerful magic, but it can only be drawn upon once a day. And she'll put her hands upon the staff and the staff will begin to grow green. Now, when she touches the staff, she's gonna give the staff the forest fey power. And the forest fey power is, it can heal up to six allies within 60 feet. It's 1d8 plus one, for each fey that's consecrated. So as you consecrate another fey or, or restore another celestial being, it'll become 2d8 plus two. As you restore another fey, it'll be 3d8 plus three. So it has a maximum power of healing is 3d8 plus three. It, it will do that to all of the allies with uh, up to six within a 60 foot radius, but it can only be used once per day. And so that is the force fey power that'll be tied to the staff. What you're gonna wanna do here in um, Foundry is I have that marked in secret. So that one, you can go in here and you, you can do this. It's just on this one only, you go down in here and you turn it off the secret. So now the players will see th this particular one uh, it has this one ability. You're gonna also have to remember that when you restore another Fey, you're gonna have to increase this to 2d8 plus two. So that's how that staff works. So she gives them the staff, she's restored them the healing, uh, and then she says to the players, the self-proclaimed Lord Strahd has been weakened. He no longer has the power of the force to call upon the wolves to aid him. He will soon discover the forest fane has been consecrated and it will no longer be safe here. I will take the green gem, and when you have restored all of my sisters, I shall return to aid you to destroy Strahd and lift this corrupted mist forever, freeing Barovia and her people from this accursed existence. 
Now, what happens is, in addition, Strahd had been able to call upon the wolves to aid him and spy for him, but with the force Fae restored, with the Fae restored, uh, he no longer has this power. Um, you could, it's up to you, the end's discretion, allow the party to have that power instead. You know, maybe once a day they can call upon the wolves to, to aid them. I'll leave that up to you. Depends on what Strahd you're using. We'll talk about Strahd here at the end. So that is it for the Forest Fade Shrine. Um, I do have here, this button up here is made by, by clicking on it. That is the, um, uh, through Monk's active tile, so you can turn off and on. So when the phase restored, you can see this whole place lights up really pretty, uh, and it's really, really cool, and you're gonna be playing that music. In addition, uh, I do have uh, here all the links, uh, and I'll just drag this over here too, it should be over here. All the links here that you can just click on. Here's the Forest Fay link here. It tells you all about the Forest Fay and the counter and the ritual. You have the Forest Fay herself, by the way, this gives you the background on the Force Fae. She had disguised herself as Lila, the elderly, uh, eccentric midwife who makes mushroom tea and a rudimentary herbalist specializing for midwife. And she's, a, I'm assuming, to the point of like being invisible. Everybody generally knows her, but gives her no mind. She's the last person that anyone would have any any knowledge of her Sebek that she'd have any powerful knowledge or about the Fae. And the only reason people remember her, you know, from generation to generation is her, her teething bomb for fes, fuzzy babies. The only person that she's entrusted the secret with of who she really is is Muriel Venshaw, who is the descendant of the Venshaw were ravens who were given the green gem to, in the first place. So there's a bunch of stats and information on the Forest Fae here. So that's the whole Forest Fae, um, thing here. So let's move on and we're going to do the um, Swamp Fae next. So here is the the Theater of the Mind map of the Swamp Fae by um, James RPG Art. Again, I like to always bring this up. It kind of sets the mood. People can kind of see this. It's a common frame of reference, visual reference for our players. And then we're going to take them right in to here to the battle map here. And here is the Forest Fae battle map. Now, once you, you get to the here and you're gonna restore this particular one, let's bring that one up here. In fact, I'll bring it up right over here. We got the notes right here, boom. Um, the forest uh, fane here, you're gonna have an encounter three waves of bullywog. So remember the bullywogs have taken over this fane circle. They, they worship the swamp fane now and they see her Remember, Strahd cursed the Water Fae to the Swamp Fae. They see her as their goddess. So the Bullywog come. Um, the first encounter here, these are all um, uh, quick encounters. So if I just click on this, you can see it'll just automatically populate them. I'll just click on it and show you how it works. You say run quick encounter. It even brings up the combat tracker for you. And there they are. So the Bullywogs show up. Here they are right here. And what happens with the bullywogs is you've got regular bullywogs and you have this one croaker. And the croaker has this feature, I'm just zooming in for you so you can see them. The croaker has this feature um, that is called the ruglog or whatever. And when he sings this, this, this kind of croaking sound, all the bullywog within 30 feet of him gain 10 temporary hit points. But what else happens is when he sings this song, when you do this, when you have him sing this song that's going to empower these bullywogs around him, it's going to call the next wave of bullywogs in. And they're going to come in in two rounds after he makes that. So when he makes that sound, that's the first round. After the next round, you're going to have another wave come in. And the other wave is going to come in from the, from the northeast. I'm going to just click on them and bring them in. We'll see them. There they are. And you can see we've got now... A bunch of bully walks in. They, they come in and they come in again with another croaker. And when he croaks and, and gives the temporary hit points, we get the last group of them in. And this one includes one royal uh, in there. So we're going to run that encounter uh, here at the bottom. And you can see they're going to come up from the bottom here. And there's the royal bully walk. We're just going to bring him in there. And the royal has a lot of some other special. He's a multi attack. He has the Croak Decree, uh, and any ally of the Royal that's within 60 feet of the Royal can hear the pronouncement and has advantage on their first attack roll the next turn. So he's, you're gonna, you know, you wanna operate him in the back, he's like the king, right? 
you know, and he's going to have his his croaker guard next to him, uh, and then he's going to try to try to uh, to attack. Now the 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 bullywog initially want to try to capture the players and take them back to their village, turn them over to Baba Zaga, the Swamp Fae. Now, what's going to happen as this is going on, you're going to have a player, here's the, uh, here in the middle is the uh, altar. You're going to have a player in the center in the altar who's going to be trying to do the ritual. Now, the ritual takes three rounds to perform. So as you're attacking, your other players are going to try to have to hold them off, and the player has to take a an action during their turn to perform the rituals. It's going to take three rounds the ritual is an action um, that the player has to do. So your other players are going to have to try to hold off the bullywogs. Now, if the the bully walk, if you're able to complete it, and the player that's performed the ritual is not interrupted, um, the 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 Babala Zaga will appear and become eventually the water fate. Now, if they are interrupted, you have to redo that turnover. So every time they're interrupted, your turn you have to start your turn over again. Uh, during the Fey. Again, you're going to place the blue stone on top of the altar in the middle. You're going to have to make sure that you bring the right thing. If it's the summertime, it's going to be the grapes. You can find those at the Wizards of Wine. Uh, the Barovian apples are from the orchards in Kresk. And we have the Barovian bread that can be purchased from any Vlaki inn uh, or tavern or bakery, what have you. Uh, so you have to make sure you have the right one. And you're going to have this poem. Now, this poem is carved into Marina's monument. It can be found in the library in the abbey. It could also be in uh, Strahd's study in Ravenloft or in Argenvoss. Remember, the blue gem is hidden in a random places. Um, the poem, this poem is actually a poem by, it's the first stanza of, of uh, Loud Without the Wind uh, Was Roaring uh, by Emily Bronte. She wrote uh, of Withering Heights. I thought it fit really well in this, and I was trying to find, you know, classic historical poems that would work really well. So the, this, again, makes from some good role-playing. One player's got to read this during their turn, you know, and hopefully not get got, not get knocked out or, or interrupted um, and use this as an action. Now, again, I have a button here. If, if you're able to restore, um, let me just, in, in this combat tracker over here, if you're able to restore um, the Fey, right, um, you're going to click this button over here and... The lights will eventually come on. There, there's the lights, and you're going to play the angelic music again. And we are bringing in the water fay. So she will appear here, and here is the lovely water fay that that will appear. In fact, I, you know, what I should do? I should just show you them because I have them right here. Here's the water, water uh, fay, water fay. There she is, the gorgeous water fay. So she will appear. Uh, there and she, uh, if she appears in the in the in the the, the bullywogs are here. The bullywogs will bolt. They will they, when they see Baba Lazaga transform into the water fay, right? Uh, the ritual is complete. The remaining bull, bullywogs will flee because she's now the water fay. And what um, the water fay says, and I'll just zoom in on her where I say this is they see um, Babala Zaga transform uh, after you do the ritual. You know, as long as the players don't start, you know, go full murder hobo on her, uh, she'll, <laughs> she'll turn into the water fay before their eyes, and she'll say, um, It has been long. I have lost my way. I have done things I cannot bear to speak of, and I have forgotten the beauty of the world, and I was fueled of malice and hate. For the corrupt darkness of the Lord Strahd and my anger at the loss of my sister, sisters. I would stoop to Strahd's level of depravity, and I would forswear my abilities and station as a Fey of Barovia to feel Strahd's beating heart shred beneath my teeth. You have freed my spirit, my friends, my saviors. My heart will likely be strained for all of time for the things that I have done in the state of insanity. You have saved my life, my soul, and most importantly, restored my mind to me by returning my power. I owe you everything. Now, she is, uh, during this, she is going to restore all the player's strength, health, if they're poisoned, or any negative effects as they're restoring her. And she'll say, Vengeance 
Anstrad will be mine. I care not if he knows of these proceedings, but they do not put they do put you in danger. Now is not the time to speak, and I must seek to find my sisters and restore them. I will need your help. Now again, if they don't have the staff, she will give them the staff, and then she will imbue the staff with her water fey power, which is this. And she'll say, the staff is imbued with the power of water. It draws from water's ability to slide past even the most treacherous rapids as though they were nothing but air. It is powerful magic, but it can only be drawn upon once a day. Now the water uh, fade power in the staff uh, is a bonus to all saving throws of allies, up to, uh, up to six of them within 60 feet for 10 minutes. So it gives all the allies a 1d4 plus 1 saving throw bonus for each fae that's consecrated. This lasts for 10 minutes. So all the allies will have 1d6 plus 4, but if you restore a plus 1, if you restore another one, it'll be 2d6 plus 2, and if you restore the third fae, it'll be 3d6 plus 3. That means for 10 minutes, you're going to have this bonus on all of your saving throws. So this is super powerful for them. It only lasts 10 minutes. Um, and if you restore all three phase, this is a nice thing. Now, you can only use this once a day, but this will be a great thing in your final fights at Castle Ravenloft. After she gives you the phase staff, she will say to you, The Dark Lord has been weakened. He no longer has the power of water to aid him in resisting against the elements. He will soon discover the water fane has been consecrated, and it will no longer be safe here. I will take the blue gem, and when you have restored all of my sister, I will return, and with the knowledge of the final act to destroy the Dark Lord and lift the mist forever, freeing Barovia and its people. Go with my blessing, and strike fear into the very heart of darkness. Now, uh... Uh, the party members get a temporary five plus five bonus to resist fire, cold, and lightning. This lasts just for one day from the moment she gives it to him to till the next day at this time. Strahd has resistance to fire, cold, and lightning damage. When this is gone, the, the Fane, uh, he has a five, the plus five bonus. When this is gone, he loses that, that, um, that resistance. Uh, it's, like, it's unlikely since the Water Fae would literally rip Strahd's beating heart from his chest uh, if he did have of this this resistance. So uh, restoring her lowers his resistance significantly, and then the players get that plus five resistance. So that is the, the Water Fane Shrine, the encounter, uh, how to go about restoring it, the poem, and where the poem is located. So let's go ahead and move on to the Mountain Fae. And the Mountain Fae is on Yester Hill, so we're going to go ahead and activate that. There's Yester Hill there. Got a little bit of different of music change. Again, lovely, lovely um, scene by James RPG Art. The stone circle is up at the top. And let's go ahead and activate this Stone Fane. So here is the beautiful map by DM Andy. Um, and this over here is where the uh, Wicker Man will be early on in the campaign, and it'll march off and start destroying stuff unless your players defeat it. Standing above where the Wicker Man is are the stones um, where the there's an earthen uh, area where you can bear where the where the mountain uh, redstone gem is going to reside. So let's bring this up. We've got the we've got the um, thing here for the stone, the Mountain Fane. Now the Mountain Fane, as the players try to restore the Mountain Fane, and we'll just turn on the uh, restore button over here. So you're going to have this light come on, and this this uh, area will start to glow, and you're going to see this area glowing, and you're going to have waves of, of encounter. See, what, what happened here is um, when, when Strahd desecrated the stone circle, he placed a curse on any undead. So when they Parties uh, attempt to remove the glyph stone here to place the red stone underneath. The undead will come alive. And these are undead uh, druids from the surrounding graveyard. So I'll do the first one here. The first one are going to be three undead that are going to rise. Um, and I'll show you where they are here. And these, they're, they're going to be very close. And I'll just zoom in on them so you can see them. Here's one right here. He's going to... This is an undead um, druid, right? And it has 
a, a glaive and drain life multi-attack, and it's going to start marching in towards whoever's performing the ritual. So these undead are going to are going to be focusing on um, the person that's performing the ritual. And I think we have a we have oh we have a, the pos, pos, uh, possessor here. The possessor uh, has withering touch and possession, so it'll try to possess. This is going to be require a saving throw, Christmas save, or it's going to be possessed by a ghost. Um, so that you have these possessors that'll be coming here. Uh, I'm going to just click them so you can see them. There he is. He's going to be coming here. And they're going to start focusing on the person that is performing the ritual. Now, in this red circle area here, um, the undead uh, have advantage on saving throws while they're in within the stone circle. So as soon as they get within this area where this kind of red light circle is going on, they have advantage on saving throws. So if you try to turn them, they're going to have advantage on those saving throws, okay? Now, uh, once they move in there, at the end of the second round, four more dead uh, undead will arise. I'll just bring them up here and uh, show you them. These undead will rise over here. So you've got one, two, some more of them here. I'm zoomed way out. And so they're going to start moving in uh, on the players on the stone circle. And then you have your final wave of undead that will rise up uh, to the players and attack them. So eventually, you know, you're going to have, uh, what is that, three, four, seven, uh, and five. You're going to have 12 undead um, they're, they're coming from out, further outer waves, marching in on the stone circle, trying to interrupt it. Again, it takes three rounds to complete uh, this. Uh, again, if they get interrupted, you're going to have to start again. However, uh, if uh, you restore the fane while the undead are there and the mountain fae appears, all the undead just fall to the ground. They start to dissolve into bones, and then they dissolve into dust and blow away when she is restored. The ritual, again, is the, the uh, red gem, which we have right here. You need to, to place that underneath the stone. If you lift up the stone, if you investigate underneath the stone, there's a there's a uh, uh, little earthen area, and then you need to cover it back up. And then, of course, bring one of the, the tributes and place it here, uh, depending on the time of year. And then the poem is the Mountain Fade poem. This can be found in the library in the Amber Temple. Busty can recite the poem. Uh, Kazan also knows the poem. This poem is by, um, oh, this poem is the, I gave you the wrong poem before. Uh, the wrong poem for the Water Fay is, uh, where is it? Poem, poem, poem. Oh, wait, here's the items. Water Fay poem for the Water Fay. The Water Fay poem is, sorry, the Water Fay poem I know I made a mistake there, is by uh, Lord Tennyson, and it's called The Brook, uh, which is a really good poem by Lord Tennyson, by the way. Uh, so that's the Water Fame poem, my mistake. Um, and then the Mountain Fame poem is the uh, first stanza of, of Loud Without the Wind Was Roaring, which I thought was more appropriate for the, for the mountain. And so the player can read this poem while trying to restore that. When you do do the ritual, obviously the angelic music kicks in and we have our mountain fay up here. I'm just gonna show you our mountain fay really quick. Another pretty image, there she is. And here's the big reveal, the big, big, big surprise reveal if you're able to hold your tongue. Uh, the mountain fay, uh, you know, she disappeared. And she took on the persona of an elderly fortune reader from long forgotten Vistani clan and joined the Tesser Pool clan centuries ago, now as Madame Ava. She keeps a careful eye on those entering Barovian Castle Ravenloft, lo looming above the Tesser Pools. She has fooled Lord Strahd himself for centuries, playing a double role as a double agent. She possesses enough magic that if she performs a card reading for those with the fortitude, the reading may reveal some truths that are even hidden from her. Um, her only trusted ally is the Wizards of Kazan, but since he lost his memory, she passes, she has passes the centuries alone. So this is a huge secret. If you do this, if you keep this a secret and she shows up, the mountain face shows up here, you know, first as, um, Madame Ava, and then slowly becomes the mountain fae. This is, 
this is a credible transformation. These are those moments in the campaign where the players are like, shit, what? Madam Ava is the Mountain Fae? You know, that's that's what you're going for here. Real special uh, thing. Let me bring up the um, the Mountain Fae thing. So when she appears after you've performed the ritual successfully, um, she appears and she says, I have searched through the ages, searching the realm, sifting through generations of noble people from all walks of life, holding out for a select few whose spirits burn bright enough to carry out such a difficult task. And here you are. Why, I do declare it's enough to make an angel cry tears of joy. Well, to be sure, I am no angel, but this will have to do and express to you how the millennia have crept by when you've got so much an odorous task in front of you. Yet here we are. The time is short, but words take long. I shall now throw my cards on the table, as it were. There is no bottom to Strahd's pit of ingenuity. If I once held my secrets close enough to my breast that he could not even see them, he ought... They are laid now bare, and for he is certain to know this. My friends, my blessed saviors, I shall grant you the power to finish your task and restore my sisters. Again, if they don't have the face staff, she gives it to them. Um, and she, again, she's healing them. All the players immediately uh, are cured of any injuries or automatically fully healed up as she's being restored. She gives them the staff and she says to them, the staff is empowered with the essence which you would call the lifeblood of the mountains. It's powerful magic, but can be only drawn upon once a day. It recharges at the instance that the first ray of dawn light strikes the highest peak. This gave me the tiniest advantage over my sisters over these centuries. You see, it enabled me to stay above Strahd's reach all of this time, and his grubby, corrupt mists could never climb high enough to stunt its powers. Of course, Strahd doubtlessly knows this and is bound to make some attempt to try. The Mountain Fay power is this. It will give up to six allies within a 60-foot radiance only for 10 minutes, 1d6 plus 1 hit points. For each fey you uh, bring back, it adds another 1d6 plus 1. So maximum 3d6 plus 3 hit points for 10 minutes. can only be used once a day. It's pretty powerful. So each player gets 3d6 plus 3 temporary hit points. This effect lasts for 10 minutes. So those are the three magic fey powers that are imbued to the staff. Um, they are each only can be cast. Each only can be cast once a day. Uh, two of them only last for 10 minutes, and one of them is just a quick instant heal. This th this staff isn't to to give you damage power against Strahd, but it allows, so you guys, so the players, and I was just really thinking about this. I didn't want to give the staff a, a weapon damage. I wanted to give it the ability just in case you didn't have a healer or just in case you were just really getting throttled pretty bad by Strahd. This allows you to heal, temporary hook points, and get some saving, um, some advantage on saving throws, uh, saving throws in there. Uh, and I thought that would be really good. Two of them are very short in there. So that's the weapon. Now, what happens is once you reveal the last Fey, right? So you bring her in the other the other three fey materialize. And what happens at this point, I'll just put them over here. What happens at this point is a fey are going to give you their final quest. And uh, the fey are going to say this. So I'll go through this ritual here. So the mountain fey says, Strahd does not fear death, for he has the power of resurrection. This power resides in the Heart of Sorrow, and it's well protected in Castle Ravenloft. The Heart of Sorrow is far too powerful to be destroyed by mortal weapons and magic. And the Mountain Fay hands her red gem to the Forest Fay here in the middle. To Lila, there she is. And at the same time, the Water Fay hands her blue gem to the Forest Fay. And the Forest Fay says, the Heart of Sorrow was created with a po portion of celestial fey magic. It is half of us, but together with the fey gems, they form the other half, the Broken Heart. 
And at that moment, she combines the three gems together, the red, the blue, and the green. And she holds up a, a, a gem that radiates kind of a blanket of rainbows of the three colors. Bind the broken heart of sorrow with the heart of sorrow, and together they will form the heart of Barovia. And at this point, the water fae shares with them, Strahd will no longer have the power of the heart of sorrow, and he will no longer be able to resurrect. If the dark prince is destroyed, the corrupt mists will lift forever, and Barovia will be free at last. Your final quest is to take the broken heart to Ravenloft, to bind it with the heart of sorrow, and then face the dark prince. If you should fail, Barovia will be lost forever, for we are entrusting you with all of our magic. You will go with our blessing, but know that you must not fail. No power in the universe can match what you hold right now. If you fail, Strahd will terrorize the people and corrupt the lands forever. The Mountain Fae has one last thing she says. We will know when you succeed, as we will be called forth into the heart of Barovia, and we will return to the land. And with that, the, water, the Forest Fae hands to them the heart, the broken heart. And I have that right here. So here is the broken heart. And the broken heart is, is a combination of the three gems. Uh, there's three, three rounds. So when you take it to the Heart of Sorrow uh, up in Castle Ravenloft, it takes three rounds to bind the broken heart and the Heart of Sorrow together. The binding must not be interrupted or the process must start again. Once bound together into a single heart, the Heart of Barovia, it will rise up and break through the roof and high into the sky. It will cast a bright light as bright as the sun, and the mist will burn off. And afterwards, the heart of uh, the heart of Barovia will return to the mountain, the mountain of Amber, from which it came, along with the the Fays. And well, Strahd is dead, or well, Strahd, you got to kill Strahd, but the mist will be gone. You could leave, but now you got to kill Strahd. Uh, once you kill Strahd, he you know he he won't be able to resurrect at this point. He'll still be alive. You'll need to kill him, but you guys will be your players will be the friggin' super epic heroes of, of Barovia. Um, the conclusion, the fate will disappear. Um, they'll know, you know, what you, you, you know what you must do and to travel to Ravenloft. Now, uh, I have some notes in here. There is a CR 27 Strahd, pretty ruthless. You know, you're gonna be giving some players some pretty solid weapons with this staff um, and uh, the ability to destroy the Heart of Sour. Now, important note, the Heart of Sorrow and the, the uh, Broken Heart gem cannot be destroyed. They are, they're impervious to being destroyed. They can only be bound together, forming the, the Heart of Barovia, which will rise up and, and cast a light burning off the mist and then go back to the mountain with, with the Fae. So, so that is it. That is the, the quest. That is the three locations, the Forest Fane, the Swamp Fane, the Mountain Fane. You have the magic gems, you have the spells, uh, the poems. Uh, oh, uh, I want to talk about the, the uh, Yef um, um, scroll. This is another item that you can find in one of two places. It's called the Yef Rissel scroll. And Yef Rissel is really an anagram for Fey Circle. Now, there's two places that you can find this. Uh, if you're in the Burgermeister's house, in Velaki, Victor's upstairs trying to do that teleportation and rules is written. He's trying to figure out this particular spell. He's already killed off one servant, if not more. Um, this spell, uh, it's an anagram for Fey Circle, and I actually have it in here, and you have to figure it out. It's a puzzle. Um, and obviously, you know, if this is Yef, Cir uh, Yef Rissel, you know what this word is, Yef Rissel, and you'll have to translate it. Now, what this this uh, is is a teleportation spell, and you need to inscribe the fey uh, the fey symbol into the circle, and you can teleport anybody. It's a cantrip type spell, but you need to uh, um, uh, do the, the uh, do the circle, create the circle, and then draw the circle in there. It's a ritual spell, um, and then put the symbol in it, and then you can go ahead and transport to one of those locations. So these are the symbols here. Obviously, this is the forest fae. If we looked at the forest fae's shrine, you'll see these all around here. 
that is the sign of the forest fay there. The mountain fay symbol is this one here. And if we go to the mountain fay, you're going to see the mountain fay. It's right on the stone uh, there. It's the uh, psi symbol, Greek symbol for psi right here. That is the mountain fay. And the last one is the uh, fish for the water fay, which is not, which I think is in there too. Let me see the swamp fay. Yes, there it is. Right there is the sign of the fish. These other ones. Um, so if you draw this on the ground, you can teleport right here to the shrine. Uh, but you need, the players need to translate the scroll. The scroll again is found either with Victor or it's found with in the uh, wizard's tower uh, with, with uh, Busty uh, the bus. So there's the image of it, of the face circle, and then they can go ahead and try to decipher it. Now, if you do the wrong symbol in it, any creature who steps through the teleportation will take 3d8 plus 3 damage. So you got to make sure you got the right symbol drawn, you know, otherwise that's why Victor, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's, he's, he's killing off his, his family's servants, and I don't think his parents are too happy about that. Well, this is it. This is the, um, the big epic um, quest that I've been working on putting together for some time. I hope you really enjoy it. I think this is awesome. I think it, it gives us purpose to go to several locations. It gives you a great, a great backstory of all of these creatures and who Baba Lazaga is. It gives you some story about Argonvost, Amber Temple, whole reason to go to Amber Temple to get the red gem. It introduces also Dragon Carta's other great uh, fan quest adventures up in the uh, up near uh, the Salinka Pass up in the snow covered mountains. Please, please click like and subscribe if you like this. Again, if you want the PDF of this guide or the foundry module, join the Patreon page. The books, uh, by the way, all the books are available for free, including the Barovian, uh, the Fanes of Barovia. Again, this is Parm King signing off. May all your roles be critically successful. I hope you really enjoy the Fae Quest. And you crank your epic campaign for 10 to 11. <laughs>